Linux servers are awesome. As I'm sure you'll agree, there's just something that's so much fun about setting up a Linux server. We could run our favorite app, set up a VPN server. There's just so many things that we can do. But when we run into a problem, how do we solve it? Where do we actually look for some kind of information about what's going on so we can make some sort of decision? Well, in today's video, we're going to look at system logs, the basics of system logs. We want to understand where the information is stored when it comes to logs, what some of the log files are actually for, and why we might want to look at them. And we're going to take a look at all of that in today's video. So let's get started. So here on the screen right now, what you're seeing is a terminal that's actually connected to a Fedora instance. I'm actually going to show you the default log files on another distribution as well. And the reason for that is because different distributions might name the log files differently. So here I'm actually using Fedora 36. And later in the video, I'll show you guys some of the log files on Ubuntu as well. But since we're here on a Fedora instance, let's go ahead and check out the file names for the log files as they exist for this distribution. Now it's quite common that log files will be found in slash bar slash log, so let's start there. If I list the storage, you'll see that we have a bunch of log files right here inside this directory. A lot of them will actually end in dot log, like you see right here, but not all of them do. For example, we have last log right here that doesn't have a file extension at all. And this one actually does have log at the end of the file name, but no period. So it is common to see a .log file extension, but I don't want you guys to be under the impression that there's consistency here when it comes to how these files were named. So if you're simply looking for every file that ends in .log, then you're not actually seeing all of the files that might be here. So let me clear the screen and then do a normal ls without a long listing, because that helps us fit everything onto one screen like you're seeing here and we'll look at some of these logs. Now, I'm not going to show you every single log file that you might have. There's no shortage of log files, and it'd be a super long video if I went over everything you might have here, but I'll definitely cover the most common. Now, I'm not going to go over these in any particular order. So randomly, I'm going to pick the boot.log as the place to start here. And as you could probably guess from the name, the boot.log file actually pertains to the boot process. So what I'm going to do is try to cat it out. I might not have permission to do this, but let's just see. And I don't. And it's going to be very common that you might not have access as a normal user to a log file. But if you use the sudo command, or if you're logged in as root, then you should have no problem viewing the log files. So let's try that again. Boot.log. Now this could be very useful if you're troubleshooting the boot process. An example of this might be, maybe you are watching the boot process, you're watching a server boot up. And one example of that is maybe you're, I don't know, watching the boot process. Perhaps you have a physical server and you have a monitor attached to it. Or if it's a VM server, you might have a KVM or something. But anyway, you're watching the boot process. You're seeing all of these messages fly by the screen and you catch a glimpse of the word error within the output. But the problem is that the boot process flies by so quickly that you might not be able to read the message before it goes away. So you can think of the boot.log file as a log file you can check when you want to go back and read some of the messages that might have appeared during the boot process. Now, as an aside, on other distributions, you might not have a file named boot.log. I'm on a Fedora system, so your results might vary depending on your distribution. If you don't have a boot.log file, you don't have to worry about it. Just understand that if you do have a boot.log file, well, now you know what it's for. And if I scroll through the output here, we can see all of the messages right here. So it looks like in my case, everything is good. I have OK straight down the board here. So at first glance, I'm not seeing anything that's of potential concern right here. It looks like the boot process, at least in my case, has been successful. Continuing, we have the dnf.log file, which is another log file that's specific to Fedora. I will show you its equivalent in Ubuntu as well, but the dnf.log file, what that allows us to do is view a history of the packages that were recently installed on the server. So for example, we might have an error message, and that error message might have something to do with packaging, packages that are installed. Maybe something is missing, like a shared library or something like that, or perhaps a package was installed that's conflicting with packages that were already installed. So what we can do is take a look at this log file 
and then see which packages were recently installed. And for this log file, I shouldn't need sudo to view it, so let's just use cat and then dnf.log, and there it is. So we can see that the RPM Fusion repository here on Fedora was downloading some information, so that's fine. And there's a lot of information here, as you can see. So not just package installations or removals, there's other pieces of info here as well, but there's no shortage of information. Now most of this right here is just the repositories being refreshed and things like that. But right here, we can actually see where I downloaded the GNOME console application. I actually installed this about six or seven days ago or so. But as you can see right here, I've downloaded a package and the log file contains an entry right here where I went to install that package. So again, if that's something that you want to find out, you want to find out what's been installed recently, then checking out the dnf.log file, at least on systems that use the DNF package manager, that's going to be a great way to find out. Now another log file that I would like to point you guys to is the wtemp log file. So let's go ahead and check out the contents of that file. And it's just wtmp in the var log directory. And this is strange, we're not able to read it. There's all these funny characters here. And yeah, there's some legible information, but at least for me, I can't understand what exactly is going on here because I see, well, a bunch of weird characters. What's going on? Well, actually, the WTMP log file is known as a binary log, and we could gather that it's not a simple text file on account of the fact that we didn't get simple text when we went to inspect the contents of the file. But to view a binary log, if you see a situation like this where you can't read it, then that generally means that there's some other command that you have to use to view that log file properly. And in our case, it's actually the last command that's going to be the command that we will use to view the contents of that file. So I'll enter last, just like that, and press enter. And now we can actually read the information. So up here we have the binary version, but then when I use the last command, like I've used right here, we actually see some contents. And the whole purpose of the WTMP file, or WTEMP file, depending on how you want to pronounce that, is it gives us a detail of all the login and logout events. So if we wanted to, I don't know, audit the users that are logging into our server, then the WTEMP log file will be the one that we want to inspect, and we'll use the last command in order to do that. Now another file that I would like to let you guys know about is the btemp file, btmp. And of course, we could try to cat out the contents of that file. I wouldn't recommend it, but we can certainly do it anyway. And of course, permission is denied because that particular log file needs root access, and I forgot about that. So I'll just type sudo cat and then btemp. And well, I have no idea what this is. So basically, we have another binary log and if we have a binary log, like I mentioned, we'll need to use some sort of command in order to get the information from that log file. And to do that, what we'll type is, again, sudo, because in this case, we will need that. Then last b. So previously, we used the last command, and now we're using last b. And b, I believe, stands for bad, because the btemp file is specific to bad login attempts. So for example, if you're only interested in the bad login attempts, if somebody's trying to break into your server or something like that, then you're probably not going to care about the successful login attempts. So the last b command, or the btemp log file, is going to contain bad login attempts. Let's give it the options ADF, and in this case, F is capitalized. Now before I actually press enter, what I want to do is let you guys know what these individual options mean. And starting with the dash A option, what that's going to do is show the host name in the last column. The dash D option there in the middle, that's going to attempt to match DNS names to IP addresses, which is probably something that would be useful if we had that available. And the dash capital F option, what that's going to do is give us the full times for the times that are shown from this command. So I'll press enter. And right here we have an attempt where I try to log in apparently. But this particular instance is not publicly available, so we shouldn't really see anything here, at least not all that much. 
so only having one entry here is not all that surprising to me. But anyway, if you have a server that is publicly available, or even if it's not, and you just want to know, you know, who's trying to get into your server, then the command that I just gave you, sudo last b dash ad capital F, that's the command that you can use. And that information is stored in the btemp log file, which is a binary log, so we use the last b command to view that log file. Now what I'm going to do at this point is actually wipe this computer and install Ubuntu on it. And reason being, this is my footage PC and there's some recordings that I need to get done that actually use Ubuntu. So what I'll do is I'll just wipe this machine, install Ubuntu, and then I'll be right back. So here I am on Ubuntu. This is the exact same machine as earlier in the video, except like I mentioned, I went ahead and just wiped out Fedora and installed Ubuntu. And that's just how it goes when it comes to making YouTube videos. I find myself installing various distributions all day long. And you know what? I wouldn't have it any other way. But as you can see, here I am on Ubuntu 2204. So let's go ahead and take a look at the var log directory. And we should immediately see how Ubuntu differs from distributions like Fedora. And although we do have a few log files here that are the same as in Fedora, most of them are actually different. Now when it comes to Fedora, the file names for the log files on that distribution should be relatively similar when compared to CentOS, Red Hat, Alma Linux, Rocky Linux, or basically any distribution that is based on the Red Hat family. And then here on Ubuntu, the log file names that you see right here, other distributions like Debian, for example, are going to have similar names for their log files. So it's not like you have to learn a completely different set of log files for every distribution. There's going to be a lot of overlap when it comes to a distribution family. And Ubuntu being heavily related to Debian, then of course on Debian and distributions based on Debian, then a lot of what I'm going to mention is going to carry over to that as well. Now, first of all, what I want to do is check out the auth.log file. And I will need root for that, or at least sudo. So I'll type sudo, and then I'll just cut out the contents to keep it simple. And it's var log auth.log. And the auth log actually is short for authorization log. And on a Debian or Ubuntu or an equivalent server, then what you're going to see in this log file are login attempts. And if I scroll through here, we could probably see, I'm assuming, a situation where I fat finger the password. Normally I edit that out of the video so you don't know that I'm messing up the password. Maybe I shouldn't have given that away. But anyway, login attempts are stored in the authorization log or auth.log for short. And another thing that the auth log is actually useful for is troubleshooting. Now what I'm going to do is do a tail follow on that log file, which is a very, very, very important trick to learn because when you have a text file, not a binary log file, but a log file that's a text file, you can follow the output of that log file and see the output show up on your screen as soon as anything is actually entered into that log file. And what I'll do is type tail-f and I will need sudo. And you'll see immediately what this does if you didn't already know. And then I'll type the full path to the authorization log. And the tail command, as you might already know, that gives you the last portion of a particular file, so that way you don't have a flood of text if there's thousands upon thousands of lines. If you only care about what's at the end of the file, then the tail command by itself is useful for that. But as soon as we add the dash F option for follow, then you'll notice I can't enter any commands here. I have a blinking cursor. And what this means is that I'm in follow mode. And in this mode, Anytime something new is written to this file, then you're going to see it right here. Now what I'm going to do is show you an example of follow and why it's so useful. So I'm currently following the log right now. And on another computer, what I'm going to do is attempt to SSH into this particular computer. So I'll do that right now. So what I've done from a different computer is I've attempted to log into this computer via SSH and on purpose, I typed the incorrect password. So for example, if you had a user and you are managing a Linux server and that user comes to you and lets you know that they can't actually connect to the server via SSH, then a very common troubleshooting technique in that situation is to have your user try again while you're in the process of following the log file, 
the auth log, and you can see the actual errors or the reason why they're not able to log in. In this case, it's a simple password failure, which is not all that exciting or even all that uncommon, but I wanted to show you guys an example of why you might want to follow the log file. And as you can see right here, I was able to follow the authorization log and see in almost real time what exactly is happening on the server. If I saw a bunch of attempts here, and this particular instance was publicly available, then that might be a cause for alarm. That might mean that somebody's trying to get into my server, but it's not some outside attacker this time around. It's just me with my fat fingers and my inability to type a password. But anyway, back to the topic at hand, which of course is logging. What we've just done is we've taken a look at the authorization log, and that was in the var log directory. And these are the log files that exist, at least on Ubuntu and Debian systems. And the authorization log is a very important log file. So if you're on a Debian or Ubuntu system, then it's really important to understand and keep in mind that that particular log file is the one that you should check if you have, I don't know, some sort of authorization related thing that you're troubleshooting, because you might find your information within that log file. Now there's another log file that's very important to keep in mind, and that is the system log. And we call it syslog for short. And depending on how your distribution is configured, you may or may not have access to this particular log file, the one I want to show you, which is the system log. So I'll just cut out the contents of the syslog. And if it doesn't work for you, you could just simply prefix the command with sudo, and that should enable you to inspect the file. And as we scroll through the output here, you should be able to see what exactly this log file is for, which is, well, system events, and that makes sense. It is the syslog. So if you're troubleshooting something like hardware issues, you might want to take a look at this file. And sometimes, if you're troubleshooting something like USB, maybe a flash drive, and I don't know, maybe it's not detected, then you can actually tail this log file while you insert or remove that particular device. And if your computer or server is recognizing that device, then you should see something in here that will show you that it's been found. Now, if you don't see that, you might have something wrong with your USB ports. But anyway, the main point right here is that the syslog is for, well, system events. That's why it's called the syslog. And it's right here in the var log directory. Now, in the previous section, what I did was I showed you the DNF log. And that log file is going to be very common for systems that have the DNF package manager distributions like Fedora, for example. But here on Ubuntu, I have the apt package manager. So I'm not going to have a DNF log file because there's no DNF. But what I do have is an apt directory. It's closer to the upper left of the output there. And if I go inside that directory, you can see that I have a few log files right here as well. And if I add the long listing, we can see that the permissions here are such that anybody can view these files. So I should be able to cut out the history.log file, for example, without sudo or anything like that. And sure enough, I was able to do that. And like I mentioned earlier, I just set up this installation. I was running Fedora on this particular machine. Now I'm running Ubuntu. And what you're seeing here in the log file are some of the packages that I went ahead and installed off camera things that I generally want to be available, like GNOME Tweaks, for example. I wanted to add that. I did some package cleanup with the apt auto remove command. And I have an entire video that's all about apt if you want to check that out. But another thing that I did right here is I performed a full distribution upgrade, which in terms of Ubuntu and related distributions means to install every available update. And as you can see from a fresh install of Ubuntu 2204, I had quite a few packages here for installation. And the purpose of this log file right here is essentially the same as the DNF log as we've checked out in the previous section. If you have a situation where, I don't know, maybe something related to packages isn't working quite right, then you can check this log file, see if anything was changed recently or installed, removed, updated, things like that. For example, if you're having updates with one of the packages here, maybe LibreOffice is giving us trouble. I don't know why I decided to use that as an example, but I did see that a LibreOffice related package was indeed part of the output here. So if I was actually having problems with that or any of these other apps that you see here within the output, then that might give me some kind of a clue that an update might have came along that is having some sort of a problem. And if that's the case, then, well, I can act accordingly, which might be to roll it back 
or to file a bug report or something like that. But anyway, the takeaway here is that if you want to find out what types of shenanigans are going on with your Linux packaging, then you could check the DNF log on Red Hat Family Servers or the appropriate file within the apt directory inside slash var slash log for Debian and Ubuntu, and you'll be able to get that information. So let's go back one directory and see what else we have here. Now I've already gone over the wtemp and btemp log files, so we really shouldn't need to see that one again. And of course I've gone over the auth log, so we already know what that is. But let's check out the dmessage log file. And the dmessage log file, and again that was dmesg, that log file is in some ways similar to the syslog file. The system log shows you system related events, and dmessage shows you the same thing, also system related events. It shows it a bit differently, so you have a different format for time, which we're not going to get into right now. But you'll see different information here, and you might even see the same information about some things as in the syslog file, with the difference being that there might be more information here in the dmessage log file. But if you scroll through, you might be able to see more information, especially if you are troubleshooting hardware, because this is actually a kernel log file, and that could be very important when it comes to troubleshooting hardware, because you need to understand how the Linux kernel has actually seen something that you've attached. So for example, right here, you can see that I have a Logitech USB mouse. So we can see that it recognized that, and it attached it right here. So we know where exactly this is attached to on the system. So we could keep track of that. If we're having issues with our Logitech mouse, then we can probably use this information to help us troubleshoot that. If nothing else, if it doesn't show anything here at all when it comes to USB devices, but we definitely did plug something in, we might have disabled USB ports, maybe some sort of driver issue. But all things considered, if you want to check out hardware-related events, the dmessage log file is one way to do that. And in addition to that, there's actually a dedicated command for the dmessage log file, and this log file is not a binary log. I mentioned earlier that you might need a special command for binary logs if you run into one, but we can actually execute the dmessage command like you see right here. And in our case, it actually gives me permission denied, which is kind of weird considering that I can actually view the log file. But what I'll do is just run sudo exclamation mark exclamation mark, which just runs the most recent command, but puts sudo in front of it. Might save us a little bit of typing, even though dmessage isn't really all that long of a file name. Anyway, I pressed enter here, and you can see we have some colorization, which is really nice. We have the same information though. So for troubleshooting any hardware, then the dmessage log file would be a fantastic way of doing that. So I'm going to go back to the home directory here. There's another example of logging that I want to make sure that I go over, and that's the journal ctl command. The journal ctl command is specific to systemd and distributions that use systemd, but quite a few distributions do. Fedora, Ubuntu, Debian, Arch off the top of my head, and many others, they all use systemd. But what exactly is systemd? Well, systemd is actually an init system. It's beyond the scope of this video to give you a full overview of systemd. It's definitely something that we should go over if we haven't already done so. But journal ctl is also a command that comes along for the ride on a system that uses systemd. And what the journal ctl file allows us to do is inspect actual units or services on the system and view the log files that pertain to those particular services. And to use the journal ctl command, what you do is you type dash u and then the name of a unit. You might think of a unit as a service that's running in the background, a daemon if you will. There's different names for the same thing. But what journal ctl is going to do is allow us to view output pertaining to a specific service. For example, I'm running ssh on this computer, so I'll press enter. And now I'm seeing log entries that are specific to SSH. Now systemd is probably more famous for its systemctl or system control command, which allows us to do something like start and then a unit name, which could be Apache or something like that. And this command allows us to start, stop, enable services. And there's another video on my channel that goes over this in more detail. But the reason why I bring up systemctl is because if you can use systemctl to start a unit, for example, let's just say you have a web server, 
And on that web server, maybe you've installed Apache. I haven't installed Apache on this one, but the point is, if you've installed something and you can start it or control it with systemctl, then chances are you can use journalctl to view the output of that unit. So getting back to journalctl, you already saw in the previous example that I could run journalctl-u and then the name of a service. Again, anything that you could start or manage with systemd should be a prime candidate for this. But another variation is I want to show you the follow mode of journalctl. You just type dash f along with any other options that you might have. So in this case, the full command is journalctl dash fu ssh, which is kind of a funny set of options there. It's not intentional at all. It's just dash f for follow and dash u for unit. We want to follow a unit. And in this case, we're going to follow SSH. And this is very similar to tailing the authorization log like we did earlier. But the difference here is that the output is specific to SSH. So I just added a bunch of spaces there. And I'm going to attempt to log in. I'm going to fail the password on purpose. And as you can see, I failed the password on purpose a few times here. But I was able to get the output and follow the output of the SSH unit via journal CTL, which is another way that we could do it. There's nothing wrong with using the authorization log. The authorization log might have some additional information in there that might not pertain to SSH. So you could argue that running the journal CTL command, this one right here, and following specifically SSH, is one way that we can actually troubleshoot something like connecting to SSH, or maybe if a user is having a problem using SSH, this might be one way that we go about trying to find information about what kind of problem that person might be running into. So hopefully this video was helpful in teaching you the fundamentals of logging in Linux. If nothing else, if you actually run into a problem, you'll know one of the places where you can look for possible answers or at least to get some sort of context around the problem that you might be experiencing. And in this video, I showed you some of the log files on a Fedora system as well as an Ubuntu system. So hopefully it's helped you out. If you found value in this content, please click that like button and please also subscribe if you haven't already done so because there's some awesome content coming very soon that I can't wait for you guys to see. So with that said, I'm going to start creating the next video for this channel right now. And I'll see you again as soon as that video is finished and uploaded. But in the meantime, thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it.